what's the definition of a true F1 then? It's like, I don't see what they're quantifying. I don't know. Not there. I don't know. I don't want to speak for them at all. I just heard that's, that's what they said. That's what they said. Yeah, a true, a true F1 is a parental line that breeds true for a specific trait, AK-47. Simon's created tons of F1s, you know. I, I, I thought an F1 was a full one-to-one -one hybrid. Or, one hybrid. Like, or sorry, a combination of two a combination of yeah. two parental lines yeah. that breed true for one trait. Sorry. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I was thinking parental yeah. line, but yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch of true F1s in cannabis. Not, not yeah. I said. Yeah. Not a ton, time, but they're out there for sure. I was just going to uh, cross a, a Vietnam black to uh, the M10, which is the M10 is the Afghani one. It's a it's about ninety five percent no deviation Afghani, and then I don't know how uh, how true to type that uh, Vietnam black is, but I would consider that an F1 hybrid. Yeah, it's just going to be a P1, right? P, two P ones give you two, yeah two P ones yeah. give you an F one yeah. Yep. yeah 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 or you could do like a you know P two but yeah two parental lines two IBLs basically two inbred yeah. lines yeah, yeah. make a yeah. true like two F one because uh Mike Mike does a lot of that or has uh, you know come across both pure of each and then or got them from somebody that had real F1 stock and he, he'd probably be up on that conversation. I mean, P1 should be, I mean, after F7 or F8, they should be close to P1s, right? If it's done well. I would say at seven, yeah. 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 I, some of the stuff I've been working, I'm seeing like by F5, it's pretty, you know, if, if you've got, a lot of homozygosity in the line to start with by f5 you can you know but definitely by f7 8 yeah with even the most heterozygous stuff out there yeah just everything we start with now is multi-generational poly hybrid so it's uh, hard to start with little square one stuff That's why I would think seven, <laughs> but yeah, you're right. So uh, I want to broach a subject for you guys, and it's going to be a little strange. Um, so I had a conversation. I'm going to I'm going to tell a little story and then see if we can get into it a little bit. Uh, I had a conversation with Cornbread Ricky. I don't know, five or six years ago at the Emerald Cup. And we were chatting for quite a while and we're talking about lines and breeding and crossing and, and stuff that you do. And at the end of the conversation, I've thought about this. I, I still think about it every once in a while. It, it came down to the conversation was there's only two ways to go. One is in the business or in the environment where it's cannabis, you're either looking for a stable strain or you're looking for a cultivar. Right. Like, Josh, I think you did a, a huge bunch of CBD stuff, right? Oh, sorry, no. I couldn't get my phone no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah. So, so, what, so it, in, in that business environment, you were looking for uniform seeds to plant. You weren't doing clones, correct? Or were yeah, you? I mean, for the most part, they were, you know, we did experiment with clones for a little while. It just wasn't really a viable business model. Um, once, yeah, so you know, it's a lot. It's a lot more work than putting in a seed. But oh, so, yeah. the, but, but, so it, but, but I think what the conversation came down to is hunting a cultivar or creating a stable strain, and they're not necessarily the same thing. Right. I mean, if you can find a really special plant and you're running a cultivation facility you're running a small shop or you just, you know, you're growing your own cannabis. If you can get that one cultivar that just stands out about everything else, um, that's what most people are interested in. And at the same time, people are interested in a good line that's been worked. That's a stable strain. 
So one's got uniformity and the other may or may not have uniformity. And that uniformity is not as um, important because you're just using clones. And it made me think about it when we were all on about a month ago, uh, there was a comment um, about don't breed with stressed plants, right? And if you're really going to breed to do crosses, you want healthy plants that have been unstressed and you'll, you know, you'll get the, the genetics that are in that plant to come through with whatever attributes that you want from that plant. But once that plant becomes stressed, we talked about it before, you get these epigenetic changes, right? And, and sometimes the changes might not be bad. They could be good and or bad. So, and then it got me thinking about one more thing, and I, I mentioned it to Trav earlier. Some of the great strains are bag seeds. They're herms, right? So what if you, with intention, stressed a plant to change it on an epigenetic level and then went hunting for a cultivar? You're not going to find a stable strain because it's probably going to add... Uh, a hermy quality to it, but you might be able to find a really good plant. That this any of this makes sense to you guys at all? If I was going to sell something, that would have been the uh, you know the original way to do it was to go to the end of life stress, and uh, you might have uh, less hermaphrodite traits that pop up by doing that right there and find a unique cultivar versus uh, a chemical stress that uh, or hormonal change through chemicals too. Uh, I don't know. I don't get into breeding that stuff like that. So uh, that's a good question. Good line, good, good line of thought. So I like the first part of your thought, whether breeding for pretty much, you know, a single plant to just be able to reproduce that clone or to have a stable line. And for me being a novice and very small scale, I definitely fall into the first camp where I really, if I could find one plant that I'd be happy to keep for five years, 10 years that, you know, like I'd be happy with that. So I think that's a very interesting nuance. The first half of your thought. Yeah, I just, so uh, let me give you an example. Um, I have this one plant right now. Dave, I think you've seen it, that red jaguar that I just posted up. It, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an absolute beast. Excuse, excuse me. And the, ja the jaguar um, was supposedly a stable plant. So I never ran a bunch of them till I ran a bunch. And then that male, actually, I thought it was a female. It was incredibly late showing. It ended up being a male. And this is where I think it's it's really open for interpretation. Supposedly, it was a strong male uh, or a strong line. And I picked the male. And I literally took the male and put it from a 15-gallon pot. And I down-potted it to a 5-gallon pot. Because I couldn't fit the 15-gallon pot in the location where I wanted it. Uh, and I couldn't keep the male because I had other females in that place at the same time. So think of the stress that plant went through when I went from a 15 gallon to a five, shook up all the root ball and it was in flower, right? It had already shown sex because that's how I figured out it was the male. So that plant took a lot of stress and I never released a lot of the seeds from that plant because of the fact of the stress. But I've had a few of them go out, and some of them have been hermed, and then some of them have been absolutely monster plants. Like this red jaguar that I got growing right now, uh, I mean, it's putting out buds and smells, and the, the plant's unbelievable. And in that litter of seeds that I got between the jaguar and this Panama Red Death, this shows you how bizarre it is when, when I think, and I think the stress in the plant had something to do with this. When I bred, I took the pollen from the Jaguar, put it on a Panama Red Death. I got 20 seeds. That's all I got. And I only pollinated like a branch or two on that, that Panama Red Death. So out of the 20 seeds, and this is 
you you can feel free to chime in because it's very unlikely. I got 20 girls. I got no males. So what's the odds of seeding a plant, right? And and getting 20 plant 20 20 20 seeds that are all female with no males. So I had nothing else in the room. I had and when when I do some funny breedings, I actually throw in a donor plant. So I'll put a plant in with the tent so that if there's a, if there's a nana or there's a pollen or there's something that goes wrong, that donor plant's going to pick up some pollen and generate seeds. So it lets me know with more surety that I'm getting exactly what I want. And the donor plant didn't have a single seed on it. So I, 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 I think it worked right, but I literally got 20 seeds with 20 females. So then I grow out those 20 females and I think on the, I probably selected down to 10 based on kind of root growth. And if they were scraggly, I just kind of chucked them. I was looking for the stronger ones, but then out of those 10, I got four of them that um, threw a pollen sack and they weren't shooting up um, in the midst of the flowers and, and they, they shot either one or two single pollen sacks and that was it. And I pulled them and they stayed fine, but I killed those plants cause I don't want anything to do with the herms. But this one red Jaguar 20, it just smelled different. It had a completely different structure. Made me think of you, Dave, cause it had that really strong red stem. All the rest of them were green stems. I mean, and then I took that plant and I stressed it. I put it into flower. I put it back into veg. I cloned it a couple times. I'm literally growing it inside and outside right now. And I'm not done, but I think the odds are it's a really, really special plant. And it makes me think that it's that way because of the stress the male that went through that the stress the male went through when it generated pollen. And it's only happened to me one other time with a chili verde male that produces some really, really good plants, but can give you some funky bad ones at the same time. So we're always talking about don't you, and, and me too, right? Don't use stress plants, go through the whole process. We're looking for good lines. And then I, I kept thinking about that, that conversation with Cornbread Ricky about what if you're just hunting for a cultivar, right? And it, is there a different way to find something that's a little bit special or a little bit different? Then I'm thinking about chem and cherry pie and some of these others that have this kind of hermy trait and wondering if you could actually breed like that or make crosses like that with intention, which is a little strange, right? I mean, you're going to have to go through a whole bunch of plants. You're going to have to expect some Hermes. You're going to have to expect bad plants. It's not what most of us do. Um, this is an interesting topic. Um, you know, working in the commercial side for um, quite a long time and consulting for, you know, some of the larger operations. This is one of the things that a lot of these guys are trying to figure out right now. It's like, how do we breed for, you know, basically true breeding strains? Because if you look at, if you look outside of cannabis and look at traditional agriculture, this has been part of traditional agricultural breeding programs for decades and decades, right? Trying to stabilize traits across the board in seed form so that you have, you know, desirable traits, whether it's improved yield, improved protein production, you know, uh, more bushels per acre or whatever it is. Um, you know, cannabis breeding hasn't quite caught up yet to the, you know, traditional approaches of, of uh, agricultural breeding. Um, and this is one of those topics that I think is, it's being discussed in a lot of a lot of corporate meetings right now, um, and, and we see some of the seed companies, um, some nefarious and some not, who are that's what their goal is right now. They're trying to produce high yielding, uniform, you know, seed lines. Um, some are having some success with it, and others others not so much. It's it's a challenge. Cannabis is a Cannabis is a very 
complex plant when we when we start to discuss the actual genetic me mechanisms that are at play. Um, but, but but instead of doing the stable line, Josh, right? You you create stress on a, a male that's going to generate pollen, and it's probably going to give you a different makeup than that same plant that hasn't been stressed. Oh, you're talking about like the the yeah, but so the stress is we we did this in college. Um, I had this professor who was studying the inherited traits from stress plants and he was using tobacco and what he was doing was exposing the tobacco plants to and he used some arabidopsis Ar Leona, and some other stuff but he used tobacco mainly and what he did was he would um, expose those plants to heavy metal toxins cadmium mercury lead things like that and that heavy metal exposure or sometimes he would use different types of mutagens um, like in cannabis, we see that with the triploid production that's taking place now. Like everybody's trying to do the tri uh, triploid production, triploid plants and stuff because they're supposed to be sterile and, uh, you know, whatever. But um, was it colchicine? I think everybody uses a, a spray plants with colchicine and it's going to kill most of the plants, but you're going to have one or two that survive. And if you take those that survive, that usually mutated uh, plant ends up being polyploid or triploid. Anyways, so... Yeah, I think there's something to what you're saying because you are going to express, have that male express these different genes under stress that it may not express. Like those those stress genes are going to be turned on under the stress where they're not turned on um, without stress. And that may impact um, crossover during the combination of the two chromosome uh, sets. That's a, that's a good question. It's very interesting. I haven't heard really anybody else talking about doing this in cannabis. I missed that last part, Josh. What would you say, please? Uh, just saying that that's, it's a really interesting proposal. I don't know of anybody else that's talking about doing this in cannabis. I mean, you know, I specifically found... stress in plants, like usually stress during breeding is not desirable, right? You want your right. plants to be expressing their most dominant form uh, and, and being as healthy as possible to try to avoid any potential stress genes because those stress genes are generally related to undesirable traits like hermaphrodism and things like that. But doing the stress with a male, yeah, that's pretty interesting. So anecdotally, it's pretty much happened to me twice. You know, I, I, because I like to clone them first, make sure I got something that's, that's healthy, not gone through a lot of stress. Then I'll take the other stuff and I, you know, like the rest of us, we go through our different stress processes. Um, but over the years, I've had two males that I really liked that were stressed and I didn't have copies of them and I didn't have more seeds and I couldn't do another hunt. So I used those two. And because of that stress, not a lot of them ever got really released. But on the few that have been out there, there's been some like really exceptional plants. So just makes me think with the bag seed, you know, take, you know, the number of, of classics that came from, from bag seed. At some point, some of those plants have been stressed, right? So, so at the epigenetic level, stress has the ability not only to give us the bad stuff but potentially the good stuff so it's kind of cool to think that you could go through with intention a way of doing what you shouldn't be doing in regular breeding and maybe finding that really nice single cultivar right you're not going to generate a good strain i wouldn't think or a good line but it, it's a way to hunt a cultivar and right you might find that one in a million that you're looking for right and i think right. there's a and if you look at the examples of, you know, like Trav said before, some of these plants that have stood the test of time um, and that people love, this, they're bag seed. They, they, they probably came as a, as a Herm or an F, S1 or, you know, some, something a little random where there was stress in that plant. Just um, about every one. Just the OG, Kim, Sour D, just about all, all the, you know, foundational legendary strains are 
backseat. Right. So, so instead of us do, instead of us all doing the same thing that we're all doing, which is trying to keep them healthy, trying to keep them in order, trying to follow the traits down a worked line, maybe you add stress to a plant that you really like and see if it gives you something that's that's you know call it the one in a million or whatever you want, but it's it's the special plant, right? It's not that line that you're going to continue to work, but and it's going to take more work to find that plant again, like I said, because I think you can end up with a, with a bunch of junk at the same time, right? So I, it, it just kind of, I thought it'd make for an interesting conversation, interesting kind of thoughts about, you know, doing the opposite, but doing it with intention, not by mistake. And then I, I, I want to add one more thing that, and ask for your guys' comments. Uh, most of you test, right, for, for attack, right? total active cat cannabinoids, right? So I test a whole bunch of them. Um, and I, and I do some work with one of the big cultivation sites out here where I give them a whole bunch of genetics. And what I found is, uh, I don't know how to say this, right. The variability, the, um, the dispersion rate. So we did one strain and we tested say 10 to 12 plants. And the range from those 10 to 12 plants, and this was done at a, at a cultivation facility. So all the food's the same, the lighting's the same, you know, I mean, maybe a difference in the room, but it's generally the same. That, that, the, uh, the, the, the total active cannabinoids came in on one set of plants from 15 to 25. That to me, that's really pretty big, right? And then we did another strain with the same amount where it's a dozen plants and then the cannabinoids are coming in like 20 to 23. So to me, that would be a better line, right? Because, yeah, it, now because that's it's more solid. Yeah. Yeah. That stability is crucial, especially when you're, you know, I mean, essentially we're all cannabinoid farmers, right? Like, especially if you're a commercial operator, you're, you're farming for cannabinoids. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. You say that one. So there's at least nine known genes that encode, uh, uh, for THCA synthase. Um, then there's the CBDA leakage and some other CBDA synthase leakage that kind of com accidentally converts CBDA or CBGA into um, THC. And so one of the things you got me thinking when you were talking about intentionally stressing like the male, um, that might because thc production in the cannabis plant is a essentially is part of the immune system and is a stress response right so by intentionally in stress in the male you may accidentally activate uh or promote uh if you will the thca synthase genes and it may actually, so one of the things you can do, and one of the big things that a lot of the genetic modification guys have been talking about lately is the T8, like the THCA uh, knockout gene, which some uh, companies are starting to come out with these um, gene modified plants where essentially what they've done is they've went in and they have eliminated the THCA synthase complex altogether um, by gene editing and gene modification. But if you wanted to take and make a plant that like just made a ridiculous amount of THC, you could amplify the THCA synthase gene. So the T THCA synthase is the enzyme that converts the precursors into the actual cannabinoid. And <clears throat> having more copies of that gene usually relates to having more THCA uh, compound in the plant. So what you're seeing at the genetic level is some of the plants <clears throat> have more copies of this THCA synthase, have a larger ability to promote and, and produce the THCA versus the, the ones with the lower percentage. <clears throat> It'd be interesting to look at those COAs to see if you see, are the TAC numbers the same and uh, you know similar? Like say your total cannabinoids similar and you have more minors with the ones that are like 15% and then like the ones that are 25 are just like pretty much strictly THC across the board 
people like the 15 percenters having a little bit of CBD, maybe a little bit of CBC, some CBG usually pops up in, in high-potency cannabinoids uh, or high-potency THC plants. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if those TAC are all the same and it's just the THCA conversion or <clears throat> is there fewer... Uh, is there a few copies of the, those those non THCA uh, synthase genes, and you're not getting as much production in I, that? I looked at one set, the the one that had the um, the large dispersion rate, right? This 15 to 25, and I didn't go, I didn't do a huge detail, but I think the the total THC content, right, the realizable content between THC and THCA was pretty consistent, was probably, you know, somewhere in the 80 to 85% attack range. So it wasn't, a, one wasn't real heavy and one wasn't real weak. It's just that some plants were weaker and some plants were stronger all, all in general. But I, yeah, I'm, I, I'm that, curious. That's typical. That's yeah. typical. I, I, I've seen that across the board of, you know, when I run potency numbers on stuff, especially when I was doing a lot of CBD work, um, we would see, we would see plants that. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you a good example of one: the strawberry orange trifle that just won the um, uh, Legacy Cup out in Minnesota. I bred that several years ago, and the first iteration, like, I almost didn't release it because there was the the line itself was stable as far as phenotypic expression, but the chemo, chemotype was a little bit variable. You would have like we saw some plants expressing like almost 40% TAC with as high as 32, 33% CBD. Uh, but then we would also have some that had like 16% TAC with like 11% CBD. And, and, and phenotypically, like if you were look at the, you know, bud structure, plant height, and, and even resin production, like they all looked almost identical they're very stable and but, that's all the, and that's all the same strain right yeah it's all the same strain but you would have like i say you'd have some that were almost nearly 40 percent tack and then others that were you know maybe 16 15 percent tack with like 10 11 percent cbd which is typical for cbd cultivars right like the kind of average across the board for cbd is about 10 11 percent uh, especially if you're trying to stay under that 0.3 percent threshold um you know, but like when we when we broke the thirty percent threshold for CBD, we were we were pretty stoked because we had not seen that yet. Obviously, it's not going when you get when you get over kind of the thirty to one um, CBD to THC ratio, it's it's going to break the 0.3 threshold it, just because of the CBDA leakage. Like it it accidentally uh, kind of converts some of the CBDA over into THCA during that conversion process just because of some funky molecular shit that's going on. And were you breeding plants at the same time with that stuff? Yeah. Because what I did, I, I had a couple different strains. I had, I start with a plan and it usually takes me a few years, a couple of years anyways. And I want two strains. I want to create two strains and I want to bring those strains together. Right. I, I like uh, I like something and going out and then kind of bringing it back. So like this example with uh, the 1525 and the and the 2023 range on on the tack. Um, what I did is I went with the one with the highest variability. And I said that that's got to be the female. Because I don't want that kind of variability in in production from the male. So I took the one that had the higher variability and then I selected the female that was in the highest part of that range that, that was the female that we wanted. So then when I go back to the male, I, I'm not subject to that 15 to 25 swing, right? Wait, so, were you doing a, like a back cross to the original male or one from that same generation? Yeah, what I generally do, what I really like to do is I like to have the, um, I like to have the same grandfather. So I'm going to, I'm going to take that, the male to say an orange line, and then I'm going to take that male to an orange line that doesn't have the same genetics, right? That it's an orangey plant, but it, it doesn't have the same genetics. So now 
when I bring those the the male to with each orange back together, I'm getting I, I find I get a little bit more that pops out of the recessive of it because they're fighting each other, and the male uh, is the same. The grandfather is the same on both of them. So that's I I, I kind of open it up and then bring it back. It's not really a back cross, but I I, I like that kind of method and. Honestly, I used to do the same thing with greyhounds a hundred years ago. So, I, 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 and it, I've seen it work in horses too. So that's, that's a it's just line breeding, and it's real typical in in mammal breeding. So yeah, that's uh, grandparents tell you exactly what you're going to get, and you can target everything through that method right there. So whether you're breeding rabbits or dogs, but my American bulldogs, I'm you know since '88 to current day, I've had a breeding program and that's one of my best recipes right there that you just described yeah so basically dave i stole your recipe and i put it on my plants <laughs> no, well it works for it works it, it works for plants too but yeah you keep your line fresh enough but you can still predict the outcome through that grandparent belief uh, link there so i'm gonna open it up for you guys i just the the, the fact of of stressing something and using it and hunting for a single cultivar, right, has some appeal and it's the opposite of what almost all of us do. So it's just, I, I figured it would make a fun conversation and see what you guys thought. No, it, it definitely has got my, um, my gears turning for sure. Thinking of, uh, about that. You mentioned something about breeding with the chili verde, um, the Eric uh, from HBK bread. Yeah. Um, I worked the I worked the Keylon Pylon for several years when I was living out um, out in California and Southern Oregon. I got a hold of the cut uh, in Laytonville, and um, there's not a lot known about the Keylon Pie. And the cut I had was the same one that Eric was using, and I crossed that to a bunch of different things. I actually did a chemotype conversion on that, where I took it from a thc type one dominant plant and converted it into a, a true breeding cbd dominant plant with pretty much identical terpene profile identical plant structure everything um i it, keeping it under the, the you know the 0.3 total thc threshold was a little bit of a challenge and i didn't feel comfortable releasing it to like large-scale farmers to do 100 acres with or something but you know craft CBD growers could could easily do it. Um, that's an interesting and challenging process. But I, what I was going to say is, when I was working that Keylon Pylon, and I made a bunch of S ones with it, there are some crazy terpene profiles that come out of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's all over the place. Like I've got stuff that's jalapeno popper to the most just deep cookie dough to like offensively lemon sour to ha hamburger helper chicken noodle <laughs> soup like i mean it's yeah yeah those that chili verde pack right there yeah those are uh there there's some fire in that yeah, yeah you I, did a great job with that project i i got two packs from so i think i ended up with 25 or 30 seeds and um I actually gave away all the females. All I did was I wanted a male. And um, I think the power went out. There was no light for three or four days. Actually, I had 27 plants. And this is years back. And I think we ended up with four plants that survived um, out of all. Uh, there was no power, no light. Put them back in. They went through a ton of stress. That's why it was one of those plants that it, it was definitely stressed and it probably changed something in the plant. And I gave away the girls because I was just looking for the male and the male was really, really strong. Um, but I still think it's got a little leakage. I wouldn't call it the most sexually stable um, I've worked with, but some of the plants that have been put out are really, really nice. So, but I like the chili berry. I just, that 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 was the other one for me other than this jaguar those are the two examples where i had something that was stressed and i still used it um and and that's kind of got me on this whole topic of today because it's i'm really pretty good about not using the stress plants 
And then like, you know, last month we were talking, I was thinking the same thing. It's, you know, can you do it with intention, stress a plan and get a result that's positive? Anecdotally, I would say yes. I, I don't know if it's worth it for anybody, maybe for a, you know, a cultivation facility that's going to clone only and, and sell a, you know, a, a ton of cannabis out into the market. Um, you know, they could have small programs just hunting for the, like, like you said, Josh, the one in a million of that special plant. So, and it's, it's a little different conversation than most of us have. So again, that's kind of why I'm throwing it out there. Yeah, definitely, definitely a different approach. It's against the uh, normal protocol. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely never, you, you definitely never give that advice. To anybody. <laughs> If you had the room and the time, other than that, it's real prohibitive style of search out. Right. But your results could, like you said, the results could be fantastic. It'd be nice to see somebody really do a lot of study on that. Stress man. Well, that's why we bring this up so somebody else can do all the work and tell me what the results are. What would be the uh, stresses that you guys would think of? Uh, drybacks, nutrition stresses, light stresses? Like, uh, where do you cold, think the results cold. would come back? I think drybacks, maybe. As bro science, I have no reason to think that. That's just what I think. Yeah, something that makes the plant think it's going to die, right? Right. Yeah, so, I mean, you uh, could even use chemical stressors, like I was talking about what they do. And, I would think you know temperature has got to play a big role because once it hits that 45 degree mark it's telling you that it's end of life and it is going to be stressed to shit so if you add that plus you know light deprivation food deprivation or overfeeding when over watering there's so many stress cursors that you could throw at it um just they, that's that's my normal grow protocol on my nails <laughs> they gotta they gotta fend for themselves yeah, yeah stress testing males is important too. I think, you know, like stress testing males. I've, I've been seeing a lot of hermaphroditic traits pop up in some of these super poly hybrid males. It's yeah, like, yeah. You know, I just, I just went through 50 plants, got them down to three males, got down to the one male that I really, really liked. And. I went through a couple of processes and then put them back into veg and with a clone left them in veg in 24 zero went into flower. So guess what? Those are all gone. Start again. That's a lot of work, but you know what? You keep throwing them in and you finally, and I, you know, I was pretty happy. I thought I was getting someplace. I thought I got a really wow. nice mail. I liked all the traits. And then it went, it just went into flower in 24 zero and that, that one took the dirt nap, but now I have so, to start. Uh, Josh, what do you know about uh, like a S1 male, males that are herbing and uh, pollinate themselves? So it's funny you, you uh, asked about that. Cause I've, I've actually been playing around with that a little bit. Um, good friend of mine was growing some plants out um, some some old school plants from Georgia from way way back in the day and one of the males that popped up out of the population um expressed that trait right like it, it about four or five weeks in it started throwing out some female um uh, flowers and uh, you know it was like oh well that's interesting you know what happens if those you know, like, I mean, basically it's a self mail and that is a way like, so that's something else. If you have a line, like, let's say you, you, you've got like, you know, what, what Bob was talking about doing with the chili verde, it's like, okay, you grow out a pack of seeds. Maybe it's the only, you know, known pack of seeds that uh, exist of that cultivar. And for some crazy reason, three out of 10 plants germinate because they're old and all you get are three males. What can you do to preserve the line? Because if you don't have a female, well, how can you make seeds? But just like you can make feminized seeds through ethylene inhibition with females to 
kick out that milk gene to produce pollen. You can add ethylene to males, and there's a few different products that you can get that are pretty cheap. It's a foliar spray. Now, you would never want to consume the product, right? Like the, the chemicals that you use for this definitely don't inhale those. Don't make hash from it. Like don't use that product, but you can use it and it causes an overexpression of ethylene or triggers that ethylene pathway, which causes the male to slow down its uh, pollen production and you'll start to get feminine, you know, female um, seed. So I'm actually working on that now, trying to produce some S1s yeah. from males. Uh, I've talked to a couple guys that have done it. Yeah, but Josh, um, aren't you going to get, you're just going to get all males? No. I, I, so that's what true. I thought. I was like, no, they're, I, so I talked to a couple guys that have done this. Um, and they do say that the ratio of males is higher than the female line, but you do get true, um, X, you do get some XY, uh, and XX expression through the process. I mean, cause you think about it, the, the female is XX chromosome, right? and the male is the XY chromosome. So it has a copy of the X. So the females that are produced from that male reversal uh, could just be a double copy of that XX chromosome for the X chromosome from the male without including that Y-link sex traits. Um, so it's, yeah, I, I, like I said, I'm personally playing around with it right now to see how it works. I've got uh, a, a male that I've, just started playing around with this year. Uh, it's GDP cross to, um, to strawberries and cream mail that I'd found a couple years ago from a pack from exotic Mike. And, um, I, I really didn't work with that strawberry and cream much. I wasn't overly impressed with it, but I did find a mail in there that was like, it was about the only worthy thing I found out of the pack that I thought, you know, okay, well, and I had a, a little bit of pollen from it and I pollinated a little lower branch on a GDP with it. And just for fun this year, I threw out a couple of the seeds and uh, was really impressed with the results from, uh, from it. And so I uh, started playing around and I thought, well, shit, I only, like, I only have like maybe like 15 of these seeds and I popped half of them this year. Um, so I'm like, damn, what am I going to do to make more? I don't really have a big enough selection to, you know, pick a really good female from. And because if I pop the rest, I'm going to get maybe two or three females out of this. So I'm like, okay, well, what about we start playing around with the reverse in males to see what, see what happens. So are you using Florella or are you using a specific compound? So I'm, I'm playing around with the Florel right now. And then I've got two other recipes from friends that have um, have done this work, and I'm going to try those as well, and see which one works the best. They they both claim that the Florel works, uh, but that just like in reverse in females, you're going to run into a male that just doesn't want to reverse. Yeah, I've right? got like, I, I've got Florel in the basement. I think I've used it once, and I've not got it to work. Well, I think it takes about five applications to convince a lot of males with the floral. Yeah. They, yeah. they said that it's a lot, a lot, especially like sexually stable males. Like they're a lot more difficult to really, you know, kick over than some of the females are. So it's going to be interesting though, because not a lot of people are doing this in cannabis right now, reversing males to, you know, increase population. But, you know, it's, I, males are underrated. Um, I think, uh, you know, I think the importance of the males, especially now, because there's so many companies just producing feminized seeds. Cannabis has uh, one of the largest, you know, sex link gene banks, if you will, uh, in, in its uh, genome. Like there's a lot of information carried by the male and uh, to completely cut it out of, of use would be, um, it, it would, it would, I think it would cause irreparable damage to the gene pool over time. Well, uh, I think, you know, feminized production is great for, you know, when it's needed, uh, it's good for stabilizing traits, but I did a test this year over in New York, working with some guys over there that have, um, 
uh, one of the AUCC license, temporary license. And we did uh, mostly feminized seed for their field, but I had some stuff I wanted to test over there and it was regular seed. And so we germinated the regular seed right next to the feminized seed. And it was staggering how much faster and more vigorous those regular seeds were compared to the feminized seeds. You, you got to look at it. Uh, cannabis is an annual, and it is. Some people might fight with you, but it's an annual, and out of 6,000 worldwide annuals, it's the only one with a male and female. So if you're going to cut out half of the genetics of that, it's insane to think you can get anywhere with it. You're, you're, you're going to go backwards quickly. Well, I mean, it's, spe it's special in the fact that it's it's the only one with a male and a female. So that's how you should breed. I know I'm not getting any any argument for this crew, but I, honestly, I, I I like hunting males. I, I I have a lot of pleasure in actually trying to find a really nice male. On to me, it's easier finding a good female is a lot easier. You you plant a whole bunch of them. You clone them, you, you take the best three or four, you test them, you smoke them, and you got a good female. And, One and, of the tricks in the 80s, people would test males would be using like the florel or an ethylene compound to get a little bit of bud indu induction so you could get terpene profiles and then maybe see what kind of structure the 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 uh, head's going to be on the calyx. And, uh, I, think, I think David Golder Coast has actually done that. Yeah, I've, old old school, old head people have done it and tried it. To, I don't know how, you know, a lot of time it's stubborn and they, they didn't going to show for you. But, and then you're going to get past, uh, you just kind of give up on that plant trying to get it to flip at one point. But uh, you can get some female expressions on some of them pretty easy. I've never used it for like terpene profile, but I've heard it was common in the 80s that people would do that. Not really for breeding. But just to see what expressions that male is going to deliver, and they already have a backup copy of it to use or ditch, depending on what the results were. Yeah, that's interesting. That was actually a question I was going to bring up. Um, sometimes people don't consider it a monoecious plant because it can be an intersex plant. I was going to ask if you guys consider it because that's where I was going to lead to. If it is, then it's the only annual that's known to do that. And it's like, there has to be something very special to that. But some people push back and say, since it can have both traits and it can survive on its own, that it is dioecious. But I, I don't know. I think that's just something interesting to think about. I'm always on the other side of the camp. I think it's a magical plant, a unique plant. Yeah, I, I'm I'm of the Monisha's camp myself. I think that over a significant amount of time, cannabis adapted to be able to show that you know trait, male trait, hermaphroditic trait for survival. I think it's a, just like bass, right? So if you take uh, if you take a large mouth bass and you put them in a pond and you put all females in there, they, one of them will switch sexes to pollinate, to, to survive. Right? That, like there, there's several, several examples of other species that have a similar um, survival mechanism in place. Octopus will do it and uh, yeah. snakes will do it. So uh, survival of the fittest for sure. But I will second your statement on it being a magical plant. There's no doubt about that. I've worked with, I, I grew up, you know, working in horticulture and greenhouses and things. And my, I grew up on a farm and my granddad was big into horticulture. And I've worked with thousands and thousands of different species. And I've yet to come across anything um, in the world that, that, to me at least, that is as um, unique and just fun to it's fun to grow cannabis is a fun plant to grow well you know what right. it, it it never ceases to amaze us no matter how long we do it and the yeah, other there's, thing, there's more expressions than we'll ever bring out and josh have seen a lot of damn expressions i'm sure and uh i'd love to see what you've grown out in all those big rows yeah there's some there's some crazy cool stuff like 
it's yeah every every time i pop a seed it's like you know it's you never know what's about to come up you know you hope you know like you hope you've done your homework and that everything comes out right but every once in a while you just something happens and it's just it blows your mind you know these random mutations or these recessive traits that pop up that you just don't expect you know I find it interesting. I haven't worked with it yet. Um, the like Australian bastard cannabis and some of those like, you know, odd leaf mutations and stuff, the freak show. Um, duck's, foot. The, the purpur, duck's foot. The purpur, the purple or green purpur, big single leaf that looks. Uh, oh, yeah. Looks, yeah. Looks real similar to like a uh, stinging metal leaf, but more narrow and longer. But yeah, that's a, that's a crazy strain right there. Yeah, those are pretty cool. I think, uh, you know, I forgot about Duck's Foot, Bob. I, I remember back in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, you know, when I was growing gorilla, like really trying to get a hold of the Duck's Foot just because of the camouflage, you know, like nobody would see that leaf pattern and, and think cannabis. So yeah. I was like, man, you know, I'm planting in the woods and stuff. And every once in a while we get a stray hiker or hunter or something that, you know, stumbles across my patch and, you know, if I'm lucky, he leaves me a little bit, but usually they don't. But if you had that duck's foot, like. Uh, I, I got some duck's foot sitting in the fridge. I've never grown it. Yeah. I I, I talked to a bunch of people. I have it. It's, I, I've, I've heard it's not very remarkable overall. Other than yeah. it's, chem, you know, other than it's unique mu mutation, um, that, which is cool. Yeah. No, that, that's one of the reasons it's still sitting in the fridge. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it is a unique, it is a unique, you know, it is a unique trait to have that web, uh, have that web leaf finish. That uh, Pablo Picasso, I think, is a variegated duck's foot. You know what, <laughs> you know what one that is? Pablo Picasso? Really no. interesting. Oh, it's extreme heavy variegated, uh, much more so than that chocolate, that chocolate tie that you have, Bob. I got a nice one. I got, I have, yeah, I, nice I, one. I, I, that red one that you picked out on the very beginning when there were seedlings. Yeah. I, I've, I've got that probably three feet in veg right now. It's a beautiful plant. It, that it's, one's going to turn black, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really, really nice plant. I, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do with it, but I, I, I'm keeping it around for a while. So what happened with your black uh, Colombian? Did you start the, the, one, the, the ones that I was supposed to start in July. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. The, yeah exactly. Then uh, I don't have any space right now, but yeah. on the, the next seeds I do, I'm doing, I'm doing the, the cold, the, the black. I, I got them from, from Will from Dub Chase and um, they are next in line, but with everything I had going and then the season outside, I'm trying yeah. to see if my plants can make it in New England to, uh, yeah, Josh, what do you think of this? I, I got one that's at least not going to be ready till the middle of November. What do you think the chances of that are? I mean, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> that's well, I, I'll say if any year, well, I don't know. Last year was pretty decent to, to last year was with the drought and we stayed pretty warm late, but I mean, I think we're supposed to get 30 degrees next week at night. So it's cold weather's coming pretty quick up here. We are so. about 30 today in the daytime, so uh, <laughs> we, went, we went well past our uh, our living things living outside. Yeah, yeah. We still, I still got a few, I still got a few plants out that are hanging on. We got a, another rainy weekend. I, they, I heard on the news the other day we've had two weekends since May that it hasn't rained. Yeah, you know what they were? They were Labor Day and Memorial Day. Yeah. Isn't those that are interesting. The, those are the two, the, <laughs> the beginning and the end of the summer, the two of the two weekends we've had without rain. Yeah, but it's I, been I, ridiculous. The the chocolate tie you guys are working. What what uh, was that from? Like the Draw O lineage? No, it come from Ozark Nation, and uh, he said it was passed to him, and the guy just told him it was pure chocolate tie. What more do you need to know? So it. It's an imported IBL, and it true to type. You know, it's real. It it has a it has some real unique uh, dark chocolate leather 
uh, kind of a nisi uh, and dark cocoa, real bitter cocoa terps to it. And um, really through the roof type of uh, no ceiling plant. So it's kind of like energetic and great on the first joint, but the second one really, it winds your clock pretty fucking tight. Uh, yeah, kind of get to a laughing stage about the second joint and then it bypasses that with the no ceiling thing and you, you get pretty high. But yeah, we, that's good, interesting. Good yeah. chocolate time. Yeah. That, it, have you guys seen any like uh, cantaloupe terps pop up in those? I have. Been, no, it does. It does have a, a kind of a melony of. Uh, in it, but I wouldn't uh, associate it really straight to cantaloupe or something. But there's a fruity uh, melony kind of turf that can come up with it. That's a I, real unique yeah. plant because there's a it's a true red stem on about a quarter of it, and maybe a little bit more. And those oh. are, those tend to run longer, like a 14 and 16 week, and uh, yeah, they're the ones that are kind of the ones that you want to keep, kind of keep your eye on. Well, so I, I took your advice and I took four or five girls that were the green ones and gave them to a friend. He's grown them out. And he said pretty much the same thing you did about effect yeah, on the green ones. So he, he, he said it kind of knocked his socks off. And I've got this one red one that just haven't even gone yet. I'm just kind of going through rotation. I'm, I'm stressing her out a little bit and I'm growing a couple different clones. I've never actually brought her a flower yet. So. We'll see. Are, the, are those like probably like what, 13, 14 weekers? Um, man, there's like a little early window on some. You could kill it at 12, but it's going to be on that pure, clear window right there. And then uh, 14 weeks and some, some can go to 16 weeks. So uh, nice. Ozark said that you want to aim for that 16 week one. It's the one with all of the effects. Is that the ones that you made the, I think it was chocolate tie F2s with? They're more like F7 or 8, I think, that Dave yeah, made. it's just called the IBL. It was, or no, yeah, I think it was, you released some that were just, maybe it was just chocolate tie IBL a couple of years yeah. ago. Yeah, I, I grew out a couple of those. Uh, chocolate. I've had chocolate for a long time. For oh, maybe that was it. Yeah, that was seven, it. It was chocolate. Seven, Sorry, was not really, chocolate tie. It was really the chocolate. Good, yeah. Uh, I really like that. A lot of people dog on that. If you even mention chocolate, any purist would just say don't. You know, it's like you can get trouble for saying blue dream too. Just like you know, good blue dream. <laughs> but yeah, you know, you can get yeah. a lot of shit for it. So it's crazy. I thought I thought chocolate. I. I'm still a fan of it, you know. I yeah, am. Whatever. I like it. I'm probably at F5 with that, and uh, I'm really happy with it. I'd grow it for my own personal stash. It's easy to grow. It's 12 weeks and uh, has great effects for 12 weeks. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it's uh, it's pretty uniform. I remember it's what I what uniform. I grew. It was, you know, all the – just about – I remember all the females I had, they – other than just some real minor variation in like bud structure. And I mean, real minor, and that could have even just been environmental where they were in the room and, you know, reference to the light and stuff, but the terpene profiles were stable and yeah, it was, it's phenomenal, phenomenal herb. I still have some in the freezer that's, you know, I only pull out for special occasion and shit, you know? So Bob, what do you know about the old timer ones? Uh, original sativa or what it was named haze by like ace i think got it and he just started calling it old timer one haze do you know anything about that i got some old timer haze is that different no i would say it's going to be the same but a friend of mine he just grew it out and uh, he knows the source that i got mine from and mine was uh, original exact stock that ace Dewey would have searched through and then replicated and sold and we have just different selections, but um, he just finished some off indoors, and it's 23-week uh, <laughs> Colombian, and it's like the real deal. Uh, it's, yeah, I, uh, I've got some was, of the, I've got the seeds. I've, I've from, I got two versions of Old Timers Haze, and then a couple others, and then I've got probably five different 
groups of seeds that are all Colombian gold, mostly referenced as Santa Marta. So when I tend to do a project, I, I'm looking for stuff that I could put together. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I'm, I'm going to grow my two or three or four strains all at the same time. And then I'm going to lean towards the ones that give me the best production or honestly the best effect. But um, so those are still sitting there in the fridge and hopefully I'll get to them. I mean, that'll be an interesting project. I know Kagi is into that Colombian and done some search outs on that. And I'm a so big I'm pop in there for a little minute there. But yeah, he was in. A, I, what I'm doing is I'm a, a lot of the stuff I'm doing is the components of haze. Right. You know, which nobody really, really knows for sure, but everybody knows this Colombian in there. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just always interested to see things that will go that 23 week. I, I grew it, I think, twice. I never got it really past 17 or 18 weeks because it was seeded. And uh, if you just watered it, seeds were sowing themselves with just vibration from anything, and they were just already just spewing out, you know. So I think I cut it down at 17 weeks and had 50 seeds come out when I just chopped the plant. So. It, some of the ties and those Colombians will do that real tiny seeds and small calyxes that wants to split open and they'll just self sow themselves just a good heavy wind blow and there'll be hundreds of seeds down. Well, you remember that um, Savage Organics? Oh, yeah. Um, that beast plant? So that was. Yeah. It's that a was name for it, a beast plant because it's like <laughs> base, baseball bats and fucking things the size of your leg. So that's Mac Red Haze. So that's the Cuban Black Haze with the Panama Red and the Mac. And I think he brought that to 120 days. It was long. Yeah, long. And I, 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 don't, I mean, I don't know if you guys have the same experience with any particular plants, but the stuff with the Panama in it, which is a lot of the stuff that I have, it, if I turn up the lights a little bit and feed it, it starts growing again, like it's just gone into flower. I, 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 it, I, we, we did it. A buddy of mine has a closed room. Um, you know, got some, got some CO two. He's got the whole, the whole room was all done up, and we upped the lights, and it was like a brand new plant. I mean, they grew for another thirty days after, it, after it should have been done. You guys ever do that? Turn up the lights and give it food. It keeps growing. Yeah, I've I've seen that with uh, with some well, with the Panama stuff uh, as well. It's it's a crazy some, trait. Oh yeah, like, a couple it's, of uh, mango biche right now that are, I guess I fed them to the sixth or eighth week, and uh, they're real close up to the lights, and they are their tips are just like vegging out. Little two or three little veg tips were just eight ten inches lower, still stands all a bud. So it is wanting to like. It thinks it's springtime again and down <laughs> where it lived, you know. Well, yeah. I don't think it ever goes over 14 hours or 15 hours down there, Panama. Hmm. Their total light. I don't think, but I don't, I don't think it does. Yeah, I think yeah, you're right. Yeah. I've never done the, the 10, 14, 11, 13. I pretty much stayed 12, 12. So I just give it the way my lights are set up. I could change the intensity. The other thing is I can, I can, I can change the uh, red spectrum. What lights are you running? Uh, some old kind LED 1000s. Nice. Yeah. They're, they're, I mean, yeah. they're completely programmable. I, I, I did one. I was testing some mails and I was on chat GPT, which is always a good place for me to get botanical information. Right. That, that, <laughs> that, 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 and I was, and I was, I was messing around and what I, and I realized the importance, not of just the photoperiodic aspect, but the spectrum master aspect. So what I did is I put I put a bunch of males in um, in twelve twelve. I lowered the blue and I brought the red up. So I ran seven hundred and fifty watt equivalent in red and five hundred watt equivalent in blue, and, and all except for two of them went went into flower in twelve twelve because the red light triggered them. You know what? I got a 750 uh, kind, and that's one of the only lights I've ever had that on 100% on all three channels. That thing that causes bleaching, 
Yeah, uh, you could be a foot away and it could still bleach the very tips of the buds. So it it is powerful. They have powerful lamp. It convinces plants to do shit that uh, normal uh, CHM won't. Yeah, I mean, it, I, honestly, like I love those lights. I mean, I can, I, I got eight different settings. I can, I can give it a sunset. I can give it darkness. I can, it's great, I can, except the light's very annoying to the nat to your eye. You have to. Yeah, I, I get, I get glass. That. I have glasses. Yeah. I wear occasionally. It's, 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 it's not terribly. You know, it's another part about that light though, is if you want to take a picture, all you do is turn off the red, turn off the green, and turn up the white, and you can take a picture. Right, because you don't have all the different spectrum coming yeah. through, ruin the picture. Sure. But yeah, it's funny. Yeah, you get those weird lines in the picture Light sometimes. Glasses yeah. in front of the lens as well as a quick cheat. That's, you just that's take a quickie, yeah. oh, That's my quick little. <laughs> I've done that plenty of times. But I think you can. I, th on your lens. I think you could test sex in twelve twelve, just by banging them with higher red spectrum. And it lets you know the order that they're going to show sex. What do you think about that lamp lighter's uh, light schedule? I don't know that one. Oh, my God. I don't know it exactly, but it's like three different sets of on and off during the day with a couple of little mini one-hour sleeps. You don't oh, know really? about that? Everybody no. Knows. Wait, I, I, that's you the system your... that DJ Short was using with the blueberry. It's like 18-6 something else, 6-6 six, six something. Like It's, it's, a, it's a crazy three-hour or three different daily on and off cycles but it, ends up lower, it lowers your uh, light energy use to probably 60 yeah. percent lower and the yeah, it's supposed to shorten your like shorten up the flowering time some and stuff i've seen that i've never tried it is it interesting called, Dave, concept? lamp lighter i thought it was called the lamp lighters yeah well um, it, i'll know me, i'll know i'll know it. i'll know about it by next week uh, my do you guys ever Jeremy, decrease? AK Sensi, he he's been running that, and uh, it, he said it was a tremendous uh, savings in energy, and then you got the same results and faster results. I think AK uh, AK, uh, I mean Savage Genetics is also Bob. What is it? Is it Savage Organics or Savage Gen Genetics up here? Uh, S Savage Organics. Organics. Yeah, he's running that. Uh, he he was telling me that it's it's doing great. And uh, faster bud onset, and there's a couple of things that are advantage, I guess, but just seemed complicated to me. <laughs> Do you I'm guys ever simply minded. decrease your photo period as the flowering time goes on? I have it to where mine will start 12 12, but by you know day 60 into the last stretch, they're, they're only at 10 hours of light, 14 hours dark. And um, I feel like as electricity costs get a little more expensive, just I've done the calculations, just those couple hours a day, you know, on on X amount of days, it really adds up. And it seems like it helps a lot of the genetics finish out a little better. I wouldn't say you get more necessarily of anything, except that they just look more mature and more complex. I don't know if you guys ever do that or if you just strict strict 12, 12. Uh, old method was to go two weeks, 10 hours, four weeks, 12 hours, and two weeks, 10 hours, uh, if you have a, you know, 56 to 60 day plant. So that gives you, especially with seed, it gives you a lot of faster bud onset, and then it gives you a little bit uh, nicer finish. When it when it gets that 10 hour response, it knows that it has to finish up and it'll, it'll respond to it. But that's an old, that's a real old method, but it's a good good energy savings just like you're saying you should be cautious of or conscious of uh what the energy costs are we pay a ton up here yeah it's, we uh, pay we pay a lot here yeah it's we crazy do. what gets me we pay a delivery fee like that I, <sighs> I i grew up in the southeast so we, we had cheap power in the southeast it's still like 10 11 cents kilowatt hour and there's no such thing as a delivery fee but like i you know, like two hundred dollar energy usage bill, and then a three hundred and twenty dollar delivery fee on top of it. It's like what? I do it the easy way. My wife pays the bill, so I never see how much it costs. Yeah, don't don't look at it. Don't. <laughs> You're gonna be. It, it, it's you guys National Grid out there. Or yeah. Ever source. Yeah, is it National? Yeah, I think it's National Grid here. Yeah. 
So I figured let, you guys would have a little cheaper power up there in, in Alaska. Uh, no, it's all uh, natural gas that we pipe out of the Cook Inlet, and there's a gas shortage. We're expected to run out of that pool of gas by uh, 2027, so we are we might have to import natural gas because we don't have a natural gas pipeline. We have a crude oil pipeline which doesn't do us any good. We don't have any refineries up here even for fuel. You wouldn't believe what we pay for fuel because we refine our fuel in Washington state, ship it back up on a barge to disperse it to the people here. So we, you know, we fucking pump crude oil in it and it's not efficient. So a big tanker cost a shitload to truck down to uh, the refineries. How much you guys, how much you guys paying for diesel? You know, I I think it's about four ninety or five, between four ninety and about five ten for diesel right now. Yeah, so it's pretty close. We're about the same. That's terrible. Yeah, I just they, came. They tricked us into buying diesel like 30, 40 years ago, telling us we were going to save all this money, right? All the farmers and shit went for that. I still, I still went for it. <laughs> I had a Duramax for quite a while, but um, I just kind of couldn't group with diesel. They're noisy, stinky. <laughs> Fucking don't heat up with shit up here. So, yeah, up to your neighborhood, you got to plug them in. Start at about forty minutes before you want to get in it and go. <laughs> hey, let's let's try another one for you two guys. What do you do to try to bring out recessive traits? You do anything in particular? Back cross. It's hard to it's hard to get recessive shit to, to come out readily. I don't have good luck with it. I no. think you're better off back crossing than filial selection of it, though. Yeah, I've been. I that the, so a couple of years ago. I don't know. I guess 2017. I was hunting. Uh, through some old CBD stuff and had uh, these ACDC Harley Sue uh, seeds that I think I got from Green Bodie um, from John Bays. And anyways, one of those plants popped up and it expressed the, I, I always been a fan of strawberry terps and had spent most of the early 2000s trying to hunt down anything that was truly strawberry. Like I grew the strawberry kush and nothing. I grew a bunch of stuff from like paradise seeds that were supposed to have been bred, which Luke never really released the lineage of much of anything, but I did get in touch with him and he had a strain called Sugar Bay, which was bred with uh, uh, the Swiss white that was related to Erd beer and Erd pert that was supposed to be, you know, Swiss strawberry, never found like any true strawberry, but this ACDC Harley Sue, my God, it was like when it, the finished flower, it was like opening a can of fresh strawberry preserves. Like it was just ridiculous strawberry. And I thought, oh, man, I'm going to get strawberry everything. <laughs> like, it's just going to be strawberry uh. fucking everything from here on out. Well, I go and make a couple crosses with it, and there ain't strawberry, nothing. I mean, strawberry. And I thought, okay, well, this is weird. So then I went through more of the ACDC Harley Sue, the basically brothers and sisters of that plant. Nothing strawberry ever again. So... I, I, you know, it's like, okay, this weird recessive trait that it does not pass on. I made S1s of this plant, nothing, and the S1s even closely similar to the terpene of the, of the mother, which is weird because a lot of times we make S1, you know, or, or you self align, you can usually produce offspring that are, but you, you might not get exactly the same, but by God, you get pretty, pretty close. Like even with the key lime pie, I made a bunch of S1s of it and I've grown out a bunch of those. And I mean, I could stack up a couple of those next to the original mom and you wouldn't be able to pick them apart. Done the same with several other plants as well. 
but that that strawberry so that recessive trait that's in that um back crossing uh has been the only way that i've been able and i think it just is like that amplification of yeah, that, you're, that you're set of genes finally gene. aligning the alleles uh to a, about a quarter of a percentage to get them actual correct alignment that's all that is so you run into yeah. a lot of you know you're you're tripling and quadrupling all any bad points fast as hell too so with that heavy recessive search out you can build a lot of problems so yeah i took oh my god that's i a lot took of work. i took one of the s ones uh that had the structure that i really liked that had the closest kind of terpene um had good numbers on it cannabinoids it was decent flower in time and whatnot and i reversed it back into the female so did a, a feminized you know back cross and there was some weird shit pop up in that like you're talking about you know kind of app you're also amplifying a lot of these like negative things like there was it was not it was not what i expected um I don't see many people doing that really like doing a feminized back cross essentially i don't see a lot of folks doing that and maybe for good reason uh, you know uh, that the, there was no almost no vigor whatsoever some of the slowest growing plants i've ever grown in my entire life um and all kinds of weird mutations and stuff that popped up but that's a great question like how do you how can you stabilize a recessive trait? How can you amplify a recessive trait and get it to become, uh, you know, essentially we start to transform it or transition it into a more dominant trait? Um, I think just incessant back crossing just about is the right. only way I know how to do it right now. Yeah, what like, about yourself? Like, you know, what no, do you I, do? I, I think the same thing. I, I, I think you back cross. You look at the different lines that went in that are going to give you the effect or the morphology or whatever you want to, whatever trait you want to get to pass. You go back into the grandparents, right? And try to figure, is it one of the grandparents or a combination of the grandparents? Then try to find that genetic could be even different than what you have. Um, and then get something where the morphology of the, of the plant is the same, which is what I would do. I would, you know, because you know the the mum that you want to get that recessive, that you want to stabilize that recessive trait. You'd look for a male where the plant grows exactly the same, right? The node structure is the same. The leaf morphology is the same. And I'd look for a male from the grandparent limit lineage that's as close to that mom as possible. Um, and then I'd breed into the mom that you want to keep. And then I'd select the best son out of that st structure, out of that series, right? And then I'd go back into the mom again, right? And But, I mean, that's a lot, you know, that's that's a couple of, I mean, for me, it's a couple of years, right? I mean, uh, I, I can't do that very quickly. But I, I'm, I do some of it a little bit. But honestly, it's like it takes a long, long time. I'm curious to hear your guys' opinion on when a plant simply becomes a clone only and it uh, becomes to the point where it's so recessive or the recessive trait that that single plant's showing is so valuable, it's not really worth trying to take it forward. I'd love to hear situations where you guys think that is applicable because to me, I would just keep the plant as a clone. To me, it's, a, it's an easy conundrum to solve, but that's not an easy way to share it or put it in the fridge for to pop later. I'll give you one good example of a, of a clone only. Um, useful Seeds, Randy, God rest his soul, left us this year. Uh, did some really, really nice work. And I think one of the nicer plants that he put out was called Bag of Oranges. And actually, Dave, you know, Frank, Frank went on his orange kick a couple of years ago, right? And yeah. he must he must have grown 15 to 20 different orange strains. And at the end of the day, bag of oranges is the one that he picked. So I ran out a whole bunch. Uh, I, I got a whole lot of stock from um, from Randy when he while he was with us. And I ran out a bunch of bag of oranges. 
I I selected a really really nice one. Just literally smelled like you were opening the drawer for a bag of oranges. I mean, it was just orange zest coming at you, and the plant turned black when it finished. I mean, it, it, technically it might be purple, but it it it, it was a black plant, and I took that plant, cloned, ran it again, and I took what's been one of my better males at the time was that Panama Red, that, that Panama Red 1, and I pollinated the entire plant. And I ripped apart every single bud from the bottom of that plant up, and I did it over a screen so I could keep a little keef, and I ruined all the weed. And when I got to the last single bud, on the primary collar at the top of the plant, I got one seed, right? And, and I grew that seed out, and that's a clone only. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. the other plants are gone. So, and, and in that case, it turned out to be, um, I called it Booper, it, real easy, right? Bag of oranges, Panama Red. But it, it comes out with a really, really, really nice, happy giggly social high mid 20 percent um just at, and i got one growing out back right now and josh you know what the weather's like it's probably one of two plants that i have out of 10 in the back that's not had any pm or botrytis it's had zero like the plant's an absolute champ that, so and that, that's that right there is yeah. a whole mine yeah so yeah right so that plant is really a clone only because the mother doesn't exist anymore. And the, you know, the father, uh, the pollen I have is five years old. It's, it's probably at the, at the edge of its doorstep, if that's going to work. So what I did in that case, uh, that's when I made S ones, right? Because it's actually clone only. And we've grown out a bunch of the S ones. And like you said, Josh, I, I, I got to think 90 and 95% of the plants look like mom. When, when people talk about diversity, I've not done a ton of S ones, but I've, I've done a few like this one when you, when you want to keep something around and, and, and it's a clone only, I, it's got to be at least 90% of just like the mom. So that was my real reason to S one, but that plant was, um, yeah, single seed, you know, you grow all the plants where you get 1200 seeds and you hunt and you hunt and you hunt. And I got one plant, I get one seed out of it, and it ends up being a great plant. So, you know, Murphy's Law, who could tell? <laughs> yeah. Also, that I mean, that trait of not being able to take pollen is, I, I had a, um, a cherry wine CBD plant that was like that. I mean, beautiful structure, like really like what I would consider the all the traits that you want to see and and this the you know every every aspect of this plant is is what you would want and your field and i had a male that was just stunning dusted enough pollen on it there's no way that it wasn't fully pollinated top to bottom and even I'm interested, did you notice like that? Did the calyx even start to swell up a little bit like it had taken seed? Like when you did that cross, but you didn't get the seed, like, right? You like break all yeah, the no, bunch apart and you're like, where the hell are the seeds at? But the calyx, like they kind of swell up like they're like they've got seed because I thought I had a fully seeded plant and it looked like seeds were in the in the calyx. And I'm like, oh, hell yeah. And I didn't check them. I didn't normally I'll check to see like if I got, you know. I'll poke around a little bit with a tip of a scissor or knife or something to see if the seeds in there. And I didn't do that that time. And I broke that plant apart. And I'm talking about a big plant that was outdoors, you know, that was four and a half, five feet tall, about as big around. I should have got thousands of seeds off thing. I, I got like three seeds. You know? <laughs> I mean, well, well I, I, I didn't check this one. Excuse me. Um, because I, I, what I did is after I pollinated it, um, I actually, I, I actually pollinated it at a friend's house. I have different friends that this, this way I, I make sure I don't cross pollinate. I have stuff done at different places and, and I, he, he, I did all that work at his house. So I never really checked on it. It's probably a damn 80, 90% humidity day. And that just didn't like living long. You know? Well, you know, the other trait, it's not just look at, look at Mac one. Yeah, well, you know, Jesus that, Christ, that plant. Steve, 
I love Breeder that plant. Steve was um, on Breeder Steve Million Seed Search. He was trying to find commercially viable like polyploid or triploids that didn't have pistol or it looked like a normal female and had male and female uh, chromosomes, but wouldn't breed even if there was like stray hemp pollen or uh, blown in mm. pollen or, or uh, S1 Herbie pollen or any of that. And uh, that's a good subject. That's what the map tends to be. Maybe is what a polyploid. There's something going on with that Mac for sure, because I, I pollinated the Mac one. Uh, I, I pollinated it with some with the key lime pie reversal pollen that I made. Um, How many? And, uh, like three seeds, five seeds, <laughs> like I, enough, enough pollen that there should have been several hundred, if not a thousand seeds, you know, and I got like three or four. I, I've bred it a few times and then I, I passed it because I got, I got, what i want to work the different lines but i i think same thing you know inside tent three and a half feet um nice and nice and bushy beautiful plant and just and when i pollinate it um i didn't even spray it because it wasn't with other plants so i leave it on there i go back seven to ten days later and pollinate the whole plant again <laughs> and i got 50 seeds yeah it's uh, it, it was so bad that I just was like, okay, like this, what I would have to charge for the seeds, if it was going to be seeds that I tried to sell, that you couldn't, people couldn't afford it because it would cost so much to make enough seeds to sell. You know, it's like a fucking like stunning plant though. It's slow veg, oh, yeah. you know, but uh, uh, he did some fantastic work with that. Uh, and there've been some, there's been some great offspring, uh, you know, using that plant as a breeder. It, it breeds pretty well too. I, uh, I've I've got a couple I'm really happy with. I'm thrilled with the plant. Yeah, I, I grew some. I, I crossed it with my blueberry OG male again. You know, breeding a pretty decent sized plant like you're talking about. I, I got more seeds out of that than I did with like the key lime pie uh, feminized pollen. Uh, probably maybe a hundred, maybe somewhere between fifty and a hundred. And I grew some of those out this year. Was really really impressed with those overall. Um, probably end up working that line a little bit more. Um, yeah. And, and so where I am now is I'm in this, not F2s, but uh, I'm adding um, something else to the, to the stuff that I bred the Mac with and I'm getting seeds from it. It's keeping the, the resin trait, you know, you, you, you can tell when it leans towards the Mac just by looking at the leaves. Yeah. It has that very distinct kind of, well, I, I think it kind of even like that, that leaf shape uh, has a little bit, it kind of reminds me like the OGKB a little bit, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and I'm doing a ton of stuff on the NLDs, right? The sativa stuff. So, and, and none of those have the kind of leathery leaves that the Mac have. So you can really watch, you know, when you're doing these first F1s and you get the, the three major phenotypes, it's really easy to pick from them. Yeah. I like the plant. I, it's been a great plant for me. He uh, produced a ton of seed when he did the seed line release, and I know that stuff breeds very prolific. You get males that dump pollen, and you get females that really accept pollen well. Yeah, that one cut that was, I, I got the cut um, from a good friend in Portland uh, back in, oh God, 2018 or something, and kept it around for several, several years, and that, that cut, I, it just, you know, I, I did, I, I think I've got a pack or two of the seeds that I haven't grown out that I should, um, and a bunch of other of his stuff that I need to grow out. I go, I, he's, he put out OCDM 15. Have you ever seen that one? That that's a nice plant. Yeah. I grew that, uh, grew that in a commercial facility in, uh, in Illinois. And that's, that's a great plant. It's a great, so I, I got, you know Cecil Crabtree? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So a few years back, Cecil sent me his cut of the OCDM-15. And that, that's the one I used for a couple projects. Uh, it, it's really was really great plant. I, I, I don't have the facilities to keep a ton. So if, once I get a really nice plant, I'm, I already know which lines I want to bring into it and what I'm going to do going forward. So I generally do a, 
you know, two to six breedings so it crosses and, and, um, and then I let the plant go or I pass it on to someone. Yeah. Good wouldn't, plant. Wouldn't it be nice to have a, uh, just personal commercial sized breeding facility? How about a barn with 10 separate rooms? Yeah. That's, <laughs> you can call it whatever you want. Man cave barn with 10 separate rooms I, if i had a barn with 10 separate rooms i'd want two some for animals and some for cannabis so but I, yeah. I, and, and you great. and you and you need and you could have a smaller bedroom because your wife would leave you right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's a, that's the one thing that's common with every single person i've ever met that loves doing the plant not enough space <laughs> yeah searching for expressions is about the best thing going and i don't think you could ever find something that won't surprise you so it takes a lot of space no it's it's quite a lot of fun i i truly enjoy it yeah are, are you uh are you gonna be able to finish out most of your stuff outside Honestly, I'm going to let it go. I, it's, I, yield is not a big deal because I'm really just checking the plants. I want to see what the different plants do. So I've got three that I've not run before and two 10-footers and a 9-footer. And I can't bring them in. I'm going to see how they take it. And I'll either have, you know... Uh, on some of them, I'll end up with a couple of branches of, of flower and a couple of them I'll end up with a bunch and some of them I may end up with none. But I, I, I'm going to let I, I won't take them till I see amber. They're either going to turn amber or they're going to die on the vine. But, are they know. in the ground or all those left well, outside in the ground or in pot? I, the one real nice one is in the ground. And then I got four of them, but they're. They're also 65 gallon pots and yeah. 10 feet tall. Yeah, but I think in the ground is going to give it uh, a lot colder feet real quick, or it would, it would make a big difference up here. Our soil is so cold that if you had something in the ground, it would respond to it very adversely as opposed to above ground potter of any size. So I wonder, wonder how that will affect you. Well, we'll see. I actually got two in the ground, but one of them is going to be ready in the next couple of weeks. It's actually one of the one of the Mac offspring. I put a little one in the woods without a lot of sun just to get some outside seeds. Um, I, I think I'm going to get seeds, but I, you know, they're, they're not the visual clusters that you'd like to see. They're going to be stuck in the bud someplace. Um, but since I stuck it in the woods, it's not getting a lot of light. It, it started going early and it'll be done in the next week or two. The rest of these won't be done for, I got at least one won't be done for a month. And, and Josh knows we hit thir in the thirties. It's going to be interesting to see if it can survive that. Yeah. Have you, what do you guys think about that? Like, you know, when I used to grow kind of gorilla back in the day, as I kind of, when I grew gorilla in the woods back in the day, I used to go and plant like cutovers uh, and then I would also go and plant uh, a lot of stuff in the southeast. We have a lot of longleaf pine on top of the ridges. And so those longleaf pine habitat, especially the older growth forest, it's more like a prairie than it is like dense mixed hardwood forest. Like, what do you guys think about like, you know, like partial shade kind of forest grown? I mean, to just like full sun, no cover, no shade, no, you know, just plant out in the wide open. I mean, the wide open, you're going to get better production. All right. If you got sun, the more sun and the more wind, they're going to grow. I mean, this one that I, I stuck out back, if I had to put it in the sun, I know that the plant would literally be double the size that it is right now. But it's. Yeah, but you're, um, you, you know, oxidizing terpenes on, on the crystal itself when you're getting sunburned. And there's a, there's a part of quality to shade grown. The same way with coffee or anything else that's slower grown. Might get a lot less yield, but it might be a equal or better, more unique, that's for sure. So that's what I was gonna say. It's like I noticed because I had some stuff that was just, you know, full sun, but then I would have like I was doing this uh a good friend of mine bred this Northern Lights Haze G thirteen pine bud 
uh, oh yeah, well, I, I'll come back in a minute. And so I had some that were just out full sun, you know, definitely tighter bud structure, better yield, stuff like that. But the ones that were in under the pines and were stuck in those pine forests where they got some partial shade, that, man, that was some of the best herb I've ever, ever grown. Matter of fact, every year I still chase that. Like, I try to grow that again. It's you know, like, you know, it could be part of it, Josh, because I have the same soil. It, my, I, my acreage is all pines, so the soil's more acidic, right? And, and so the plants like the soil. Like at a friend of mine, he's literally a mile away. He's got no pines on his property. He's got nothing but hardwoods. And I think the, the soil being, being where the pine trees grows tends to be more acidic. It's probably going to make the plant a little bit happier, too. Yeah, that's interesting. I was thinking about that. I, I where I'm at now, I don't have as many pines uh, as I have back in Alabama, uh, where we were at there, and uh, I'm still in the similar soil structure type, the sandy loam, but the the pines, I don't. Yeah, that's interesting. But I think, yeah, honestly, I think you and Dave are both right. Right. I I think the combination of sun and shade with wind is going to give us the best results of the plant, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, it seems, it seems interesting if you look at like where some of the feral, you know, like land race, natural populations of cannabis tend to find themselves. And from like, you know, talking to a lot of folks who've went out and, and gathered seeds from these populations or looking at historical, publications that were made um you know rc clark's book um it seems like cannabis likes to inhabit that kind of edge habitat area between you know open pasture land uh and the kind of dense forest like that edge habitat seems to be where it kind of prefers to naturally hang out i found uh, it wild in brushy riverbanks uh but it could have been from migratory uh, workers that would actually throw it out imported cannabis seed. I don't think it was a heritage hemp uh, that they could trace back to any known patches, but I've seen complete feral patches that are, uh, they don't want to grow in the open. They want to grow in a semi-shaded area. Hey Dave, what were you mentioning about other crops when you mentioned like coffee and you said long stuff prefers a certain environment? Uh, just certain things don't do as good in full sun. You know, the sun's, uh, it oxidizes things quite, and that depending on the UV levels of where things are being grown to would make a huge difference. You might find uh, low UV levels might prefer pure sun and heavy sun and do quite well as opposed to the high UV levels, like Arizona. I mean, things are definitely going to grow better in the shade down there. Most of the berry farms seem to always have shade cloths that uh, that I used to see out west. Yeah, I saw that in Salinas, big covered yeah. greenhouse. I live with black, blackberry and raspberry indoor, uh, partially shaded, huge greenhouses. Yep. We don't have that kind of agriculture up here, so and we also can't grow outdoors up here. Our light. You know our light cycle in the in june like 21 hours so uh we don't see we didn't see 13 hours until it hit freezing just about three weeks ago and now we're hitting 12 now we're hitting into the 10 hours we're losing like five hours 40 minutes a day i mean five hours and five minutes 40 seconds a day so uh we we physically cannot grow up here unless you're doing light death or have an auto so yeah, you guys, you guys are in a complete different world than me, and have tons of experience and can speak of shit that I dream about. Maybe someday I'll grow cannabis outside and have flowers. <laughs> yeah, how long is y'all's growing season? I mean, what what USDA zone are you in? Do they even uh, have a USDA three. zone? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're at three. We're in a three, so we have about a one hundred. To a 110 day total grow season for just anything vegetable wise or 
it's a short little window. So you better get your plant started indoors super early, then stick them out. But for cannabis, you yeah, but it, photo it just periods veg, too it just long. Veggies, yeah, you yeah. can't. Uh, you can grow just monstrous plants. They they love twenty hour a day full on sun. They love it, but it doesn't do you any good because you don't have a facility big enough to flower the beast in, and yeah. you can't move it. And uh, you could light depth them though. You could you could have a you know, auto or forever flowering type of greenhouse, and uh, you could kick ass. Your neighbors are gonna be thinking you're well, nobody really has that up here. So, if you did have it, you would automatically know it's filled with cannabis, and then knows you, it's not, it wouldn't be illegal because you could have you can have X amount of personal growth cannabis up here, but uh, uh, it looked funny with it. And then when it hits dark, you know, in the winter, we're we're at five hours of light total. So greenhouses look pretty funny when they're thousand watt light and they're keeping your end of the year crops going. Like I have peppers in my greenhouse right now. I killed a lot of t tomatoes, but I still have a lot of hot peppers I'm trying to let them finish out. And uh, it'd be 10 hours of light and losing five, six minutes a day right now. So you have to actually add supplemental light in it after dark. You're the only guy in the neighborhood with a light. It looks like uh, you know a spaceship landing in your backyard with a thousand watt light in your greenhouse. It's pretty, it's pretty comical looking. My wife will be two roads up and can see that thing coming down to our place. Yeah, it's pretty challenging up here. You're on the frontier. I've also had some friends talk about as far as the soil composition and when you're uh, contrasting the prairie type pines to the old growth. I've had friends talk about how it's bacteria dominant in the uh, the prairies or I guess the pine forest, the younger forests, what you guys are saying. And um, a couple friends seem to think that that's a big part of cannabis success in those areas. And they seem to think the old growth type forests that are super fungally dominant might not be ideal for an annual plant. So wanted to throw that nuance in there too, which I think might correlate with the pH, like Bob was saying. Yeah, I don't know. I, the only I thing I would know. say is um, I, I, I like the benefits of the, um, the hardwoods. But, you know, with the fallen pines, I, I didn't actually do it this year because I just, I, I did a little bit different style grow, but... I can usually go out in the woods locally in the pines and and find um, a pretty good patch of mycelium under the leaves and the, and the pine needles. That's what I was going to ask you just now is what's uh, the better soil of uh, myco wise you, in the hardwoods? I would think because of the leaf coverage, you would find uh, uh, better well, colonies of IMOs. Right. But I mean, that's what I would think too, but I've had no problem literally in my backyard you know i got a couple of fallen trees and between pine needles and leaf cover if i get down two inches i mean it's a nice white puzzle i i get a really nice flow of mycelium and i and you know depending on the grow and what i'm doing i'll i'll put those on the on as covers i'm just on the thinking plant. the more acidic pine soil that you would have less mycorrhizal activity and fungal activity just due to the difference in ph over a slightly more alkaline so I, I, yeah you would think but i i mean almost every time i've checked if i go looking for mycelium i mean not now but if i go looking for mycelium in the late spring it's there i can use it i i i, I guess they, that's why they say to collect it from you know 10 different zones and regions and get a good mix of it all natural outdoor uh, yeah, I, IMO. I was, I wasn't going through the full process of IMO, but I was taking the mycelium and then charcoal, right? So, you know, fancy name for biochar, right? Charcoal that's from the stuff that you burned down from last year, but really, you know, solid charcoal and then hitting it with a uh, insect frass and, and trying to inoculate it with the uh, mycelium and the insect frass. And I'd let that stew a little bit, and then I'd uh, transfer it to the plants. Worked pretty well. And it and everything is right there in the backyard. I don't have to go any place. It's you know I'm using what I have.
Yeah, I'm jealous. You can you can do that in your backyard, man. Yeah, but guess what? I can't I can't go out in my backyard and go get a, a a crab that looks like the size of a Volkswagen. So, yeah. so I still have to drive sixty miles myself. So that's just down the street for you up there, Dave. Yeah. And, uh, actually, on the fifteenth, the crab season opened up. They only let us crab for personal use crabbing once the weather starts freezing, and you'll get freezing spray it open on the 15th so two days or what four days it's been open now and uh, it, it gets dangerous you get like freezing spray on your boat to be able to go catch crabs it's not fun so when are you going uh yeah we are probably going to go in about a week and try to go deer hunting and throw crab pots down something something like that the weather allows us and the, during the equinox we get too much wind uh, real common we get 50 50 knot winds now, all the time. So you get a little break, try to go out, you get caught out there. Yeah, a different pleasure I don't have. Yeah, I was real impressed that your big old uh, hazy plant still standing and looking as good as it is, because I, was, I would imagine you guys have already had poor weather over there. Yeah, it's been pretty, I, you know, I, I come home and I, I was away for a little bit. I come home and it's, you know, low 50s and misting. Yeah, so, man, that's the worst nightmare right there. That right. It, it, and, and I looked at the forecast and it said sunny for two days and then it's going to rain and I get 50 degrees and mist. Yeah, and, they're panicking and putting a bunch of fans around it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're just going to let it ride, though. So that's good. I check them every day, right? If I find a little spot that it hits, I spray them and, and, and cut the stuff off. That's the one thing I would tell anybody who's listening. If they're going to grow, and PM's a little different, but botrytis can hit pretty much anything, right? And, and if you have plants that aren't getting hit by botrytis, then you're lucky. And that's the way I look at it. But when I go to cut that stuff out, like I've, I've gone over to some local farms and, and helping some people in the area and they're just ripping the, ripping the botrytis out of the plant. And, and as soon as they touch it, you can see the spores going all over the place. So if you've got botrytis and you're growing outdoors, use some kind of spray, right? Like I use the old, um, you know, I use water, milk, Dawn dish soap and potassium bicarbonate. And it's probably going to kill all the local terpenes, right? I mean, it, 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 it kind of smothers them. But I'll tell you what, it kills them all right away. And I don't cut anything out that I don't spray first. It isn't lactic acid and uh, the bicarbonate opposite of each other, though? Well, so the reason you're using the bicarb is because I'm bringing the pH above 8.2. Yeah, but I thought lactic acid was quite low, so uh, you're, it's just bypassing the, what's the purpose of the lactic acid at that point? Uh, the, the reason for the lactic, it's not so much the lactic acid, it's the first recipe I ever saw I used water and milk, and I've used water and straight bicarb, and that works, but when I use the water and the milk and the soap as a surficant with the bicarb, it kills everything. And I, I, you know, the only thing I know that works is the bicarb brings it up and the soap acts as a surficant. But when I spray a piece of botrytis and I'm cutting out, I can go back and look at that branch and, and, you know, there's no fuzz. There's it, it's around, it's going green. You got a small spot of, of, you know, that kind of Brown that's left from the, the mold that was there, but it's yeah. dead. Yeah. So I had, and, I had Ty that was outside during our, our summer was just like, like you guys, was, we had the coldest, windiest June. Uh, we had the heaviest rain on record and since at least the fifties. And then I had probably eight or 10 week Ty bud that was uh, wanting to herm on me. And I just decided to kick it outside and let it just, see what its expressions would do and it kept flowering kept flowering and it went all the way through 
a lot of storms which uh, not high humidity necessarily but a lot of rain a lot of wind then the temperatures got real cold and as the uh, oldest growth that was on there started to die it would get a little bit of botrytis but being that it was high it wouldn't just straight up rot and go to throw in a lot of mold, mold spores it would just uh, get a little brown spot and i was able to just spray it with lactic acid and that was uh that I was that was tended to be enough just to stop it in its tracks i wasn't dealing with powdered mildew at all but uh it ended up going about five, six weeks fighting that stuff and only had those tiny little brown spots where you could see the tiny original attack was. The only thing that killed it was it just, you know, came down to freezing. Right. So for mine, like, I'm not saying use the spray I use. I think I just say use a spray, right? I just, I just think it's interesting that you had the both. The, the, I've seen either or on that. Never seen somebody using both. Yeah, I use, but honestly, yeah. I, I if use. It works. I'm more power to you. Well, I've got one. I've got one tent where I use for testing. It's got um, it's got no humidity control, and it's got one small fan. So it's a little breeding ground for PM, and I get to see which one's more susceptible. And if I want no PM, I literally take those out, take them out of the light, I spray them with that mixture every two weeks, and I get nothing. And if I bring new plants in and I want to see how they're susceptible to, you know, um, volatile humidity swings, which happens in that tent, I just put them in there and I don't spray them and I see which ones can start to get PM and which ones don't. And if I'm like, if I'm running stuff in flower, then I'll change that tent. But I actually use that tent to see which ones will get PM. And it's amazing, right? Because you clean them up and you put them back in, and it's the same one plant or the same two plants that are still getting the PM. But that so that sprays worked for me indoors, so I use it. And I just think whatever if you use straight soap, if you use straight milk, L, you know, with using LAB, it doesn't matter what you're using. Spray those, spray that botrytis before you cut it out, because if so, you just cut it out, it's going to spread. Yeah, I did a little test on that this year outdoors to see. Um on the spread because I had some botrytis pop up obviously this year of all year <laughs> um, and definitely spray and I actually did a test with like some 10% just a 10% bleach spray and yeah. that worked that worked really well I would spray and then let it sit for a little while uh, usually I'd do it like in the morning and let the sun hit it spray it with the bleach and then come back in like an hour or two and it's like the buds just like dried up, like I say, you know, with the botrytis, it's like you can visually see where it's just like kind of dried up and just, you know, that chlorine reaction. Um, and I, and I, the plants that I did that to, it's made big, big difference in the spread for sure. And then I was going to say, one of the things I've been using the past couple of years, um, not just for powdery mildew, but botrytis and just the overall as part of my IPM program is uh, bacillus. Like I, I've used uh, Impello Biosciences Tribus uh, pretty religiously, both in the soil and spraying on the plants. I do five mils per gallon uh, foliarly. I usually will add a little bit of uh, molasses and kelp. I do about five mils molasses and then just a, a little bit of kelp with it. Uh, and what that does, it gives a little bit of food source for the bacillus to kind of establish itself. And bacillus is unique. And one thing that it does, especially if you're growing outdoors, I've seen this a lot over in New York and, and here in Mass, I even saw in my garden this year, a little bit of aspergillus. Aspergillus is bad. It likes cannabis for some reason. A lot of times people see, you know, they think it's botrytis and, and if it's black, it's usually uh, uh, aspergillus and, and usually aspergillus niger. And so that aspergillus um, can be, you can actually prevent it and kill it with bacillus. Most bacillus uh, produce a compound as part of their metabolic process that actually interferes with the growth and reproduction of aspergillus. Same for powdery mildew and other species of yeasts and mold. So spray them with bacillus, like a uh, C says mainly a bacillus um, species. 
and uh, there's a couple other products out there that are bacillus based but travis has three different um three different species in it and it works it works great as a just a preventative spray for botrytis aspergillus powdery mildew like we did a, a big spray in a massive um greenhouse in new york um that was just some of the worst PM I'd ever seen in a facility. And we hit it with five mils of the uh, gallon of the bacillus like every other day for a week. And it was, it was remarkable. I mean, it was, it was almost like just washing the PM off. It just, what's your, what, Josh, what's your schedule, the routine for the 5% in IPM once a week, every two weeks? Yeah. I, I start off like if if I'm so it depends if if I start off in veg with it I do it once a week and I just do that once a week till about week four, um, and then I if if I need to spray after week four I can if I'm in a commercial facility and I have to pass like total yeast and mold you have to be careful because you can kind of get a false positive on a post harvest test for bacillus so usually by the time you make it to week four, week five, if you're good at that point, you can usually make it the last couple of weeks in a big facility. If it's, if you're at home, I'll spray up to week six, week seven, like no problem whatsoever. Cause it's not going to damage your buds. It's not going to brown anything out. Like it's such a mild spray and it's just bacillus. So, you know, it's not going to do anything. The, but I do it once a week. And now if you haven't been spraying and you, get an outbreak or you've got some botrytis that you see in or aspergillus or you're seeing something funky and you want to kill it i mean you could literally spray this stuff every day if you wanted to and it's not it's because it's, it's just a bacterial you know mix it's not a chemical or anything that's going to potentially burn your plants um but i usually if i if i'm trying to beat back uh outbreak that you know i hadn't been spraying or going to a facility that's got problems that, that needs to catch up i'll i'll spray every other day until the problem's under control and then kind of go to that depending on the pressure like if it's heavy pressure do twice a week but usually just once a week and then something else i've been um noticing too calcium and silica do weekly foliars of like when you're in veg you can do calcium nitrate uh, when you, you know, hit, uh, or, uh, or calcium carbonate, the micronized stuff like calphos and flour, you know, first three, four weeks of calphos, man, what a huge difference. And then impello has got a new product called Dune. That's a silica that's highly bioavailable. I mix that and spray that once a week, man, it's made a huge difference in the overall just resistance of my plants to things like powdery mildew. Um, yeah, let, me, let me jump in on that because you mentioned the silica. So I, I'm not sure where you are in the, for the water, but the water that I have comes out, I have two different waters. I have one that comes out 7-0 treated, and then I have one that comes out of the ground, and it comes out of the ground at 595. So pretty much when I do my feedings, um, I have to bring the pH up, and uh, I use silica now. I was using potassium bicarbonate because you don't need much and it's pretty easy to, to change the, uh, the pH, but I use, I think it's, is it ag 16? Does that sound right? Yeah. There's ag 16 silica. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just straight silica. Yeah. But, but it's good for pH. And, yeah. yeah. So, so what happens is I'm, I'm adding the silica to my soil. Like I was trying to use horsetail. But it's just it's it's a it's a much bigger process. So I went with the um, the ag cell, and um, it I use it for pH now. So I it, I'm getting silica into my soil, helps strengthen the plant as I'm doing pH instead of just using something that's that's completely inert to the plant. I just want to throw that in because you mentioned the silica. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great way. I see a lot so of that ag reason. sixteen the uh, foliar spray or is that? It's actually. Uh, well, when it, the, I think it comes, the stuff I got comes, came from Build-A-Soil, and I think it's called Ag Sill 16. Does that sound right, Josh? Yeah, I think that's the stuff. I've used the, I've used the same stuff from, from Build-A-Soil before. It's yeah. great for pH and it's so, super stable. Yeah. yeah, it comes in crystal or it's powder, right? It's a, it's a, it's a dried form. 
But with the humidity, it turned into a solid block for me. So every time I had to use it, I had to chop it up. So I literally put it in with some RO water and just let it dissolve. And now I just use an eyedropper and I, I can pretty much eyeball how many mils I need of, of the liquid silica to change the pH and amend silica to the soil. So I'm using it as a liquid, but that's not how it came to me. I, I think you could, I, I've not ever used that as a foliar. Um, I've only used it um, mainly for pH and then just and substrate uh, silica supplementation, but I would not see why you couldn't use it. I'd have to look into it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you could use that as a foliar uh, application for silica. Probably leave a little residue, but I, I've not tried it. I just use it for pH, and I know that I, I'm adding some, you know, I think silica helps build a, a little stronger plant. So I, I went from what potassium bicarbonate was inert to something yeah. I think adds a little value. So that was kind of a nice plus. Is that silica micronized? I don't know. Does it make a big difference? Well, I would just say, let's see what the uptake is. A lot of silica, I have been told, is not real digestible by the plant so different yeah. forms of it it's hard to get it to absorb oh, oh i i see a comment i wanted to clarify something about our previous statement i mentioned spraying that 10 percent bleach solution on the botrytis i was not definitely not spraying my smokable flower <laughs> with bleach right <laughs> like I, just to clarify that i was spraying an infected bud that was being removed and and thrown away uh, with it. And I only did a couple of little test sprays just to see uh, that it would work. So uh, please don't anybody spray your smokable stuff with bleach. I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> just want to clarify that. But yeah, there there are a bunch of micronized silicas out there. Um, I've used uh, Silica Earth, a uh, great group of folks out in Oregon that have um, a silica mine out there. I think it's like from a natural volcanic uh, deposit and uh, man, that stuff's amazing. I don't know if they have one that you can spray. I think they're all soil additives, but they sell it in less than a fifty-pound sack. Yeah, yeah, they do. You can get it. You can get it in different kind of pails and stuff, uh, like five-pound batches. And and man, it's amazing. It, like if, especially if you do like I do, live in soil, and so I'm reusing my soil. Like I'm. I've got soil that I'm like 18, 19 runs deep on. And what it, one, it improves overall soil structure and soil tilth. And that silica just like, it was, it was noticeable within a couple of days. Like I did some side-by-side -side trials with it when I was out in Oregon and in hundred gallon pots. And it was remarkable the difference in the growth rate in those plants. Like cl same clone, same feed. The only thing that was different was the addition of the silica earth and not. And man, I mean, I like this. It's a really good immune booster. So it's like chocolate oh, yeah. or any of those things that just make the plant fight yeah. off of, like one of the better uh, pre uh elements that you put in before flower to keep that thing happy but i have never put it in past uh going into flower so i was asking about holy or if you could just spray it a little bit uh third or fourth week and yeah yeah go from there or just go with the substrate no I, i've i've you know as like consulting especially like i'll go into grows and like you know, they'll be three weeks into flower and they got plants with all kinds of nutrient deficiencies and pests and bugs and disease and shit. And so like you get the pests and the disease stuff taken care of. And then you, you know, you're also at the same time, like getting their nutrients on, um, on track. And like, if we do a sap analysis and we get that sap analysis back and we look at the numbers and like, so it goes really low, the fastest way to get nutrients into a plant is foliarly if you can do it now. In flower, you have to be careful, right? Like, because you don't want to overdo it and burn the plants because that's going to have a detrimental effect on yield. But I've noticed like things like silica, there's a lot of different silica types out. I don't know if OSA 28 still out there. That was a really great one. Um, there was another one that I think a lady here in Massachusetts made this stuff. Um, it was SIFE. It was a silica and iron um 
compound and man that stuff was amazing um i'm forgetting the name of the company right off the top of my head phenomenal yeah, stuff my well water is about a seven nine all the time so it uh if that if it's a if what is it out it's acidic no it's that's acidic. alkaline it's it's alkaline. Yeah, it's alkaline. gonna fight me the wrong direction extra adjustment but yeah I, i'm gonna start messing with that we had a, her- a real bad pm fall normally we never have pm but i think everything i saw had pm this year this is one of the tougher years i've seen in new england yeah i think that spray that that may have helped uh quite a bit somehow foliar faa late yeah it seemed to make them a little happier or maybe it's the shit i don't know what it is it seemed to work pretty good but that's the only thing i really sprayed on them was uh uh, they did lactic acid and some cold FAA. What's that, Dave? Let me on the FAA. You you're obviously making your own, right? Yeah, yeah. How how long does it last for you? Because I've got some that I made out of a nice five pound oily fish, and honestly, it's about two years old. I don't. I've never done any nutritional analysis on it. I would imagine that it doesn't in the shade at uh, 50, 60 degrees, like my garage temperature. I would think that it lasts for easy for a couple of years. I've okay. been using some couple of year old batch uh, of some, a lot of it was shrimp was mixed in with it because I was thinking I made like a Chitus and uh, FAA and I'm still using that thing because uh, I made shit five gallons of that one. And which I'm really curious about that. How did that work out? Did you notice a difference in the shrimp? I can't say I noticed a difference. I just felt good about it. Thinking it was an extra boost for uh, pest resistance. I think that nutritionally wise, it uh, it did them good. Instant nitrogen, uh, amino acids. So uh, I don't know if it did any difference or not. It smelled nicer. (laughs) Like soy sauce with sugar. It it was like shrimp sauce, yeah. It was like sweet, sweet shrimp sauce. Opposite of that Vietnamese uh, bad one. Anyway, my uh, my uh, iPad or whatever this thing is is down to one percent, so it is going to sign itself off here. Trav, you on? I don't know if he's there or not. Yep. He's always there. I am. I was just text. I was just texting the boss actually about uh, how long the show was going to go on. It's uh, it's, it's going to go on about one more minute. Perfect. Big birthday tomorrow for me, about <laughs> tomorrow. So I got to get ready to uh, entertain. <laughs> nice. You look. You look like you're what? Twenty five. Forty. <laughs> Holy. What? Shit, you're holding, holding your own good. You're All that cannabis, you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, I've been doing it twenty years. I probably look like a young pup, but I've been going. I've been running and gunning. <laughs> yeah. Impressive. Yeah. Best antioxidant I know of. <laughs> Skateboards, paintball wounds, snowmobiles, and lots of cannabis. No alcohol. <laughs> That's how you stay young. <laughs> uh, well, as usual, this was great. Uh, Peter, thank you. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. Two-year-old. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. I know I'm getting back to get back to harvesting, trying to finish up harvest here. It's uh, It's been an interesting year. Uh, for sure with all the weather we've had here in New England and I know other folks across the country have had their own challenges with the weather and um, but it's it's always a pleasure I uh, appreciate the opportunity and uh, hope everyone has a great night yeah, you guys too have a good season Dave right. talk to you Josh right, Trav, later, Bob, Peter. Later, Travis Peter see you guys Josh thank you guys see you pleasure yeah. Any uh, housekeeping or anything, Peter, as you call it, that you usually do at the end of shows? No, she's, uh, can you say hi? No. No, hi. No. Did you do a big poo-poo in your undies today? Hola, niña. Did I have to clean it up? Yeah. All right, well, I guess guess we'll wrap it up if you don't have uh, your FCP FCP pertinence. Why? No, because I don't have my earbuds either, so and I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I'm sure there's definitely stuff, but that uh, that was awesome.
Yeah, yeah hopefully, hopefully. hopefully these conversations can keep going on. Definitely really cool to listen in. Well, I appreciate the Future Cannabis Project community, and uh, stay tuned for the next adventure. I'm sure Peter has them coming. Uh, what's happening? <laughs> the suspense is killing me. <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> Till next time.